Welcome everybody to Identifying Trees in Summer. And I say summer because we're going to be talking about the trees around us in our countryside during the summer months and particularly the things that we look for at that time of year, which is the leaves, um, summer flowers that some trees have, summer fruit that they have and other signs. My name is James from Woodland Classroom. Um, I run outdoor education up in Northeast Wales and it's fantastic to see so many people in the room tonight. So a special welcome to all of you that are with me on this Zoom workshop. And also a welcome to everybody who's watching on YouTube after the fact. And there's lots of ways you guys can get involved. So this workshop is gonna last about an hour long. Um, if this is your first time on these workshops, do check out my other workshops. You can find them on our YouTube channel, uh, Woodland Classroom, easy to find. Just look for the little fox and you'll see identifying trees in winter and spring. Those two workshops are already online for you to watch as well as some ID videos that I put up. But I'll also let you know during this workshop where you can get access to more resources as well, more free resources that I've created. So what are we going to learn in this workshop? Very quickly, let me break it down for you. You're going to come away with a solid grounding in how to identify trees, native trees and naturalized trees during the summer months. We're going to be looking at features including leaves, flowers, fruit, tree form and other seasonal signs. I'm going to let you know about my three key principles of tree identification, which are good hacks you can use to help you identify any tree at any time of the year. We're gonna feature around 12 commonly found species, but there'll be many more that get touched on as well. And who knows what's gonna come up in the Q&A. And also we're gonna look at similar leaves and how we can tell them apart. Ones that people commonly get confused, which you'll find out and about on your country walks. And also there's going to be an exciting announcement about a really big tree ID resource and course that I've created and let you know all about that and how you can get access to it, including a very special summer discount. So we'll talk about that towards the end of the workshop. So this workshop is focused mainly on native and naturalized trees out in the countryside. We're not talking about exotic and garden species in this because the amount of trees would just explode that we'd have to cover. So we're talking about the kind of 32 to 50 native and naturalized trees that you get out in the countryside here in the UK. Um, how you can get involved as well, guys. Well, if you're live, you can um, put your information in the chat room, uh, say hello there and interact with other people watching the workshop. You can also put your questions or comments in the chat room. We'll be doing a live Q&A at the end. So if you've got a burning question that you definitely want me to see, save it to the end. Um, because while I'm presenting, it's difficult for me to keep checking the chat. But if I see the same point coming up, I'll try and address it. We also have Lee, uh, my partner in crime, Woodland Classroom, also manning the chat room. So she'll try and uh, weigh in where she can with some answers and useful help. For those of you watching the recording on YouTube, you can put any questions or comments in the comments section and I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as I can. Okay, I'm gonna have time for a question and answer session with the live um, audience at the end. So a little bit about me just quickly. As I said, my name is James Kendall from Woodland Classroom. I'm a bushcraft instructor and forest school leader in Northeast Wales. Um, and our aim is to reconnect people of all ages um, uh, with nature. Um, because that connect has been lost with modern life. And we do that through um, ancient skills, woodcraft skills, wild food and foraging, um, and well-being sessions out in nature. We've all heard about how nature can be good for us. But when we're out and about on our walks, it's really good to know what we're looking at too, which is what tonight's all about. Um, and my particular interest has always been trees and woodlands, traditional woodland crafts. And mine and Lee's aim is one day to have a woodland of our own that we can steward and look after and grow old with. So that would be amazing. Right. And also I've uh, got practical experience in woodland management too. So it's not all theory. I used to manage a large woodland, 300 acres in mid Wales of broadleaf and conifers. So I'm coming at it from a, a practical experience angle as well. Right, folks, let's get started right off with something that's really good to bear in mind. For those of you who've been before, you may have heard this, but it's good to refresh and get our minds into the right zone. So let's zone in. It's the three key principles of tree ID. And these are three kind of hacks that I use when identifying any trees, when I'm out and about on a walk or visiting a site. Um, and let's go on to those now. Let's get those three um, 
things for you. Let's go straight in with the three key principles, as we mentioned. They are, number one, tune in. Number two, begin with a branch. And number three, alternate or opposite. So the last one is a question. Now, if you remember these three principles when you're out and about IDing trees, it's going to put you in the right mindset. Because when I'm IDing trees, I play an elimination game of narrowing down what the tree isn't as opposed to all the things that it could be. And we're also going to do that by talking about different leaf shapes today. So that's a new thing we're going to be discussing. Let's go through those in detail, though. Principle number one, tune in to your surroundings. So this is about slowing down, maybe a little bit of mindfulness coming in here. Ask yourself, when you enter a new area, you're looking at trees, tune in, where are you? What's the context? Are you um, on a housing estate where um, trees of all kinds could have been planted? Are you on an old country estate, like a National Trust property, where perhaps old exotic species could have been brought in? Are you up in the mountains having a hike where it's very unlikely that people will have planted exotic stuff? And also it's gonna tell you a bit about the topography there, perhaps only the species that can survive in the uplands. Also, um, perhaps uh, you're in a country park, um, in a town park, that's gonna have different species as opposed to being out in the farmland. And when you're out in the farmland or in woodland, that's where we really um, can look at the main native species of Britain, the kind of 32 or so that it could be, or most likely to be when you're out and about. So the more you practice this tuning in, the, the more it becomes useful because you start to expect to see certain things. So we go into broadleaf woodland um, in West Wales and there's certain species that we expect to see the more we practice it. So tuning in is really useful to slow down, not hurry, take your time and think about where I am and what context I'm in, because that will tell you what kind of things have probably either naturally um, colonized there or been planted there. And the more you do it, the better you'll get at that one. So remember, tune into your surroundings. Number two is begin with a branch. And this is really important because when we approach a big old tree, it could be quite overwhelming. There's a lot to look at. Where do we look first? Well, if you want to ID the tree, everything you need to know about it is in like the last few inches of the branch usually as long as it's a young healthy branch with lots of leaf growth in the summer at this time of year perhaps some flowers or fruit or nuts developing that's going to tell you everything you need to know just this part of the tree the end of the branch right there because it's going to tell you how those leaves are laid out it's going to tell you a bit about the bark it's going to show you the leaves of course um, we're also going to be able to feel those leaves or smell them and use our senses that way so everything you need to know is in that branch. Okay, and make sure the branch you're looking at is attached to the tree that you're studying. And it's easily done, and I've done it on courses as well when we're out in the woods. You can be grabbing the wrong branch from the tree and you look, and it's actually attached to the one over there as opposed to the one with the large trunk that you're studying. So follow it back before you study because you could be looking at one bark from one tree and the twig from another next to it, and that's gonna throw you right off but also I'm sure you'll get some good learning if that happens. And principle number three is a question, alternate or opposite? And by that, I mean, are the leaves arranged alternately on the branch or are they in opposite pairs? So we're looking at the leaf arrangement, the bud arrangement we look at in winter. This is what I mean. Um, have a look at this simple graphic here. You can see on the left how those um, little twigs or buds are arranged alternately on the branch. You can imagine their leaves or the leaf stalks. So they step alternately along a healthy twig when we begin with a branch. And on the right, we have the opposites, where they are in opposite pairs, two, four, six, up the twig there. And that's really important because there are only so many trees that are common in native trees that have oppositely paired leaves. So if you see that, you can narrow it down to just a few and immediately we can discount and eliminate a whole load of species from our inquiry. If it's alternate, it's not so useful because there are many more. However, it is useful if we're getting confused with leaf shapes and we'll see an example of that later. So although most trees are alternately laid out on the branch, when you look at certain leaves, suddenly the fact that it's alternate can be really useful rather than opposite. I'll explain what I mean later. Here's an example here. Here's the elder in spring, actually, um, when it first comes out. And you can see here how the young leaves are in opposite pairs. So that's just a, a practical on the ground uh, example of that there. 
So they're in opposite pairs, okay? And there are less trees that are in opposites than there are alternate. This is a blackthorn coming out in spring as well. You can just see the young leaves coming out. But before the young leaves is the blossom, which I'm sure many people were enjoying in early spring this year. But look how they all turn on the branch. You've got one by my cursor, two following the cursor up, we've got three. So one, two, three, they're not in opposite pairs. Those are the three key principles. And we'll come back to those several times during um, the workshop today, but it's a good uh, thing to use. Um, right, let's go on to introducing some common leaf shapes. There's a lot of leaves out there, um, different trees, and a bit like using those three principles there to whittle down what we're looking at. We can group leaf shapes together to help us work out what we're, what we're looking at. And again, the more you do this, the more useful it becomes. Now, different field guides and, and tree guides will give slightly different names to the shapes of leaves, or they'll put a leaf into a different category. I've made up my own system, which works for me. It's very visually based, and it's very much done in layman's terms because that works well for me. I'm not a botanist um, by trade. So what I'm gonna do is show you what I've come up with. Now, where is it? There's the presentation. Here we go. I've come up with 10 leaf shapes, which have all um, got examples here. Now, 10 might seem like a lot to remember right off the bat. However, again, the more you practice it, the more you get used to it. So let's have a look briefly at the 10. And these are referring again to our common, our native and naturalized trees, not all the exotic stuff out there. So first we've got oval leaves, number one up in the top left there. Um, and that's a beech leaf we've got there. Oval leaves are the biggest group. There's the most trees associated with that shape. It's the classic. We have round leaves here. This is an aspen. Our next one is the heart-shaped leaves, okay? That's a line, you can see the heart bump at the bottom. We're gonna go into these in more detail in a second, folks. Number four, a lobed leaf. So with the wobbly edge, that's an oak there, and one of the leaves we'll be very familiar with. Number five, maple-like leaves, which is referring to a specific group of trees, but it really is the best way to describe this one, the maple leaf. Then number six, we have compound leaves. A compound leaf is one leaf made up of many smaller leaves, okay? And that one's a rowan we've got there. And again, we'll look at these in more detail very soon. Next, uh, number seven, we have the triangular leaves. It's a small group, there's not many in this, but it's very useful to parcel them off because if you're seeing a triangle leaf with three sides, it's likely only one of about two or three species that you're looking at. Now, we have long and narrow leaves. I wonder if anybody can recognize those there. They're willow leaves, those ones, and a lot of people will be familiar with the willow leaf, but not all willows are long and narrow leaved, but that's a good shape to recognize, the long and narrow one, much longer than they are wide, of course. Then we have a group that's easy to discern. We have the needles, anything that's a conifer that's got needles, very different to all the others, which are broad leaves, so we can easily pass all those ones off. And then you have all the stuff that doesn't fit anywhere, like the horse chestnut here and the conker tree. It doesn't quite fit into any of those um, shapes particularly, or maybe belongs in a couple of the categories, but we have unusual shaped leaves. And actually, those in themselves can be useful because if it doesn't look like anything else, you've got a really good chance of uh, IDing what it is. So unusual leaf, um, shaped leaves are pretty useful, really. Let's break it down a bit more, though. Let's have a look first at oval leaves, the largest group. And there's probably about 10 or 15 that I put in this group, maybe more. Most uh, trees have this kind of shape of leaf, which are out and about. We've got the beech there, uh, and we can see that, um, you know, oval meaning ovular. It's got a, you know, a bluntly pointed tip, slightly glossy. Uh, next to it, we've got the crab apple there. That's got an oval leaf, a little bit smaller. Um, not glossy, a much more finer toothed edge. We're not going into full um, idea of each individual species here. What you want to recognize is what I mean by oval leaves. So you can see what goat willow there, and I've included that because it's a willow that doesn't have a long narrow leaf, like we saw a moment ago. It has an oval leaf, and the goat willow and the gray willow have that. 
But the good news is the goat willow is the most common willow in the UK. So it's the one you're most likely to see. It's got all its fluffy catkins out at the minute and all the seeds are starting to fly across the landscape. And you might see them gathering in gutters and on curbsides. And then just below the beach, we've got the hornbeam, which is often confused with the beach. It does look quite similar. It's another oval leaf, um, but the veins are more strong on it. It's uh, more serrated along the edge. And there's a few other differences um, between those as well. But those are ovular leaves, okay? Most common group. Let's have a look at the next lot. Now, round leaves, not oval, but round. And I put the hazel twice here because it's a small group. We have the older and the hazel both round leaves and two leaves that you can get confused fairly easily. And we're gonna go into detail with those a bit later on and pick out the differences between them. There's the aspen there as well. One of the poplars also related to willows that can have a very round leaf. So round leaves, we've got oval, then round. Okay, group number three, we've got the heart-shaped leaves. The technical term for this is chordate. Um, but I prefer heart shaped because that actually means something to me. I can remember a classic, you know, cartoon heart with the bump and that bump you can see is at the base of the leaf where the stalk meets there. We've got three limes here and our lime trees are the three um, species that I would put in the heart shaped group. Um, they all look very uh, similar to each other. Um, the small leaf lime is smaller, as you would guess, the large leaf lime is a much larger leaf, difficult to tell the scale there on the photos, and the common lime, which is a cross between them, is kind of halfway between the two. Um, I've also included the hazel there, because it does have a bit of a bump, so this is where some of the leaves kind of can cross over a little bit, but that's said we're going to break it down, um, but that could be considered to be a heart-shaped leaf as well, but it's more round than anything else. So heart-shaped leaves, um, that's a, a good one to know. Um, yeah, I said limes are the main one with this. If you've got a heart-shaped leaf, it's probably a lime. Now, lobed leaves, not very many of these about. Um, the main one being the oaks. We've got two native oaks in this country. We've got the English oak or pedunculate oak, as it's called, um, Quercus roba. More classically to kind of south and central England, um, although it's planted all over the place, um, and naturally south and central England hence English oak, and then the sessile oak, more uplands north and west of Britain, um, although again, planted all over. We get more sessile oak up here in Wales. They're both deeply lobed leaves with a wobbly edge, if that helps you remember it, say a wobbly edge, but they're called lobes. The other one that we've got there is the hawthorn, down in the bottom left, that's a deeply lobed leaf as well. Looks a little bit like an oak tree, but very much a lobed leaf. So those are the kind of three main ones. I've also included field maple here, and we're going to get to maple-like leaves next. But that could also be said to be lobed, but it's a maple. So I've included it in there just so we can see the crossover. So lobe leaves. Right, here are our maple-like leaves. And the reason why it's maple-like is because they're not all maples. We've got our field maple there again, which is our one native maple tree, much smaller than the other two maples we've got there. We've got the sycamore, Acer pseudoplatanus, which is a large uh, maple leaf. And with the maples, um, think about the Canadian flag. And it's got the maple leaf on it, the red and white maple leaf there on the flag. That's the classic shape and picture to put in your mind. If you're seeing that, you're likely looking at a maple. There are other leaves that can look like that as well, such as our gelder rose we have there. That's got maple-like qualities to them. And there are also um, non-natives as well. So the sycamore is a non-native, although it's naturalized in our countryside. And the Norway maple is a non-native as well. We'll get to those guys a bit later on, but you can see the difference between them there. They do look a little bit different. But other um, uh, trees that kind of fall into this category, um, white poplar can fall into this category. You could consider hawthorn as being maple-like as well. And as I said, we've got the gelder rose there as well. So maple-like leaves, and they've got five lobes usually, five either rounded or pointed lobes. With the field maple, it's much more rounded, but the sycamore is much more pointed, and the Norway maple even more so. But generally, five lobes is what you're looking at. Some people call these leaves palmate because they are spread out like an open palm with fingers outstretched, much like a horse chestnut, actually. That's a palmate leaf. 
And for me, that's a good way to remember it too. If it looks like an open hand and the points are doing the five points of your fingers, then you've got a maple or a palmate-like leaf. So that's another good way of remembering it. Okay, next we've got compound leaves, which is a leaf made up of lots of smaller leaves called leaflets. Another way to remember this might be to say feather-like, like a feather. And if that's an easy picture for you to remember, then by all means use it. The technical term is compound leaves. There are three main ones that fall into this category, as we can see here. And then we've got an outsider. We've got the elder there. And we're gonna go into more details with these soon. There's the elder. We've got the ash, very common tree, our third most common tree in the countryside. And then in the bottom left, we have the rowan, otherwise known as mountain ash. And these two are ones you could get confused. So we'll go into some detail with that. But look how they're all made up of smaller leaves. And the number of leaves is different as well, which again, we'll get to. In the bottom right, we have the horse chestnut, which is a compound leaf because it is a leaf made up of smaller leaflets, but it doesn't follow the same kind of pattern. It's kind of compound and palmate. So it crosses um, different groups there. So I've put it in the unusual leaves category, but it's worth including there because it is technically a compound leaf. Okay, next one, triangular, a small group, but a good one to know, as we said, because um, once you've got it, uh, once you've seen a triangle, it can only be one of a few things. The main ones being the silver birch and the downy birch, very closely related and both triangular leaves, three sides generally, although they're serrated. The downy birch can be quite diamond-like in its shape as well, but look around the tree and you'll find triangular leaves on it as well. They can be quite variable because they hybridize. The other one um, is the black poplar in the bottom left. That's a lot larger than the silver birch leaves. While the silver birch leaves are so big, the black poplar leaf is more like this kind of thing, much bigger. It's a glossy leaf. It's not so serrated around the edge at all. Very different, very different tree. And actually, it's, you're less likely to see it. The birch with its distinctive black and white bark is much more common. In the bottom right there, we have the Lombardi poplar, which isn't a native at all. It's the classic long, tall conica poplar, which is um, put in rows. Um, so you uh, may see that ant about, but the leaf does look similar to the black poplar. As you can see, they're very closely related, but it's worth including. Um, that's the uh, poplars there. Okay, um, long and narrow leaves. Here we go. Mostly willows uh, fall into a lot of these, your white willow, your crack willow, your hosier, which is another willow there. Long, narrow, pointed leaves with a pointed tip there. But this, just because they're long and narrow, doesn't necessarily mean that they're large. It just means that they are much longer and thinner than they are wide. And that's represented by the two at the bottom there. You've got sea buckthorn, um, which has long, narrow leaves, but are really quite small, about so big. And then you have sweet chestnut, which is long and narrow, and the leaves can be this long, really large. So long and narrow in shape, not necessarily long, narrow, long, meaning, you know, a big size. Um, yeah, so look out for that. And I said many willows fall into this category of long and narrow leaves. Mostly, if you're seeing a long and narrow leaf, it's probably a willow, I would say, kind of eight, ten, eight times out of ten. Then we've got needles, um, which are easy to parcel off, of course. Um, we've got three native conifers, which have needles in this country. The juniper, um, which have very spiky needles. The yew, which are very soft to feel. The Scots pine, which are long and come in pairs. They're joined at the base. And the larch isn't a native, but it's very commonly planted around, especially in forestry plantations. And those needles grow in what's called a wall. W-H-O-R-L, and they grow out from one point from a wall like that, lots of needles together. So quite different, but those are the needles there. And then we have the unusual leaves, which I'm um, not gonna go into now, that's quite enough leaves for now, but there's the different groups, okay, that you can, um, that you can look for. And uh, I'm actually gonna make a tree ID leaf guide that I'll send to you as soon as it's done, which breaks down those groups with a little handy guide that you can print out or put onto your phone and take out into the countryside with you. But let's break down um, some of the commonly confused trees, okay? Let's have a look at some of those. Now, where's my presentation? Okay, let's look at alder versus hazel. These are two trees that have come up a couple of times in the workshop, 
and they look quite similarly. They're both in the round leaf category. So first we've got older there. Um, so going back to our key principles, um, both species have alternate leaves on the branch. So that principle's got so far, but it's not gonna help us any further. We're gonna have to go deeper to look at the differences between older and hazel, okay? They also both have catkins in the spring, the long dangly catkins. So there's another reason why they can be confused. So older, have a look at the tip. Often it has this notched tip here where my cursor is, like somebody has punched out a little notch out of it. Okay, so um, it's a glossier leaf than the hazel as well. Um, we can see it here. And you can see the underside uh, with the strong pronounced veins there. But have a look, the notch isn't so prominent on this one, but it is more so there. But have a look at a round leaf with a notch out the top of it. Um, let's have a look at some other examples. The other thing you want to look at this time of year are these cones that you can see next to the leaves here. These are new fresh cones that are growing. So if we're getting confused between the leaves and we're not sure whether we've got older or hazel, step away from the leaves and look for some other signs. And these cones are a big sign that you've got older because they're the only native tree, broadleaf tree that has cones. So it's got to be an older. And at this time of year, they're looking fresh and green, like little miniature pine cones growing on the branch. The other thing you can do with older is to roll your fingers between the new branches. And you'll find that the new twigs, the new growth, where it's bright green here, is triangular. It's got three sides. So that's a really good way of recognizing it by feeling that between your fingers there. So three sides on the branch. Then there's the cones from the previous year. And you can still find these hanging about on the tree, on dead twigs or on older growth. So it's worth having a look for those. This is a picture from winter, but you'll still find them now, especially on the woodland floor. So we saw the green ones earlier. Here they are a bit more mature and you can get a good look at those. The other thing to look out for with older is this what's called epicormic growth, which is growth that comes right out of the trunk or the base of the tree. Very bush, bushy, fresh growth. And older really loves to do this. There's a trunk behind there and we can't see it because it's surrounded by this new bushy growth at the base of the tree. Hazel does grow from the base, but not bushy and as solid as this here. And that's a good sign that we've got the older leaves there. You can also see the river just in the background to the left of the picture there. And alders love to grow along river sides and stream sides. There's another good chance you've got the older. Okay, let's look at the hazel now. Now there, I've put this picture up first because these hazel don't have a pointed tip, which is what hazel usually have, which we'll see soon. These have got more of a rounded tip to them, so they could easily be confused for older leaves. Very um, difficult, I think, with just those two pictures to tell the difference. So let's go a bit deeper. This is more typically what you'll see. If you're not sure you've got an older or a hazel and you're looking around, just don't look at one branch, look at several. You might start finding leaves with this pointed tip here, the drawn out tip. This is hazel. Notice how the edge of the leaf is much more serrated. That's really important as well. OK. Um, and also uh, we're looking at the mature leaf as well here. When they're younger in spring, they can be more oval in shape. So we're waiting for them to fully mature out. And hazel leaves get larger than older as well. They can get pretty large up to so big, um, whereas older leaves, not so much. The other big thing with hazel is that they're hairy to the touch, whereas older leaves aren't so much. Um, so if you feel a hazel leaf, you'll feel it's hairy. And also you'll get, um, let's go here, just go skip a picture. You'll see the hairy twig. Have a look at that new growth there and that fresh bristly hair. You don't get this with older. Remember we had the triangular twig with that one. This one is a round twig and it's hairy. You feel it on the leaf and you feel this fuzz on the new growth. And there's an easy rhyme for that hairy hazel. If you remember that, you won't go far wrong. But of course, if we're getting confused, we can look across the whole tree and you might well see this, young hazelnuts developing in the summer, ready for autumn, well on their way, surrounded by these green frilly bracts in um, um, encasing them there. Look out for these hazelnuts. As we know with the older, they don't have anything like this. They have those cones. So there's a really good sign that we've got the difference there between them. So yeah, look out for that with the difference between the two. Something else to look out for, just to muddy the water a little bit, we've got a hazel leaf on the left. And on the right, we've got witch elm, almost glabra. I'm not going to go into full detail here because we've only got so much time, but I just wanted to demonstrate to you 
two other leaves that can look quite similar. The witch elm isn't as common though, although there's a lot near where we are, but if you want to know more, I'll tell you all about a course I've created where you can find out more about the differences between them. But alder and hazel are more common rather than the witch elm there. Okay, folks, we're going to go on to the next one straight away. We're going to go to three other trees that you can easily get confused. And this is going back to our compound leaves, the leaves which are made up of several smaller leaflets. We've got ash, rowan and elder. So let's take a closer look at those and break down the differences. This is the ash, our third most common tree, very much suffering from ash dieback at the minute. You might have noticed around the fringe of the ash tree, kind of dead fingers um, reaching out along the fringe of the tree and the tree literally dies back, hence the name of the disease there, um, from the edge of the tree inward. But looking at the leaf itself, um, the leaves are in opposite pairs first. So going back to those three key principles, are they alternate or opposite? They're in opposite pairs. So you get one of this leaf growing out right opposite another. In fact, I think I've got a picture of that. You can see that here. There's one by this bud and there's another one in an opposite pair. So the buds and the leaves are in opposite pairs. That's really important. Um, and we'll tell you why in a minute. Um, have a look at the leaves there. These are the largest of the three, between the ash, the rowan and the elder, the ash are the largest. Um, you get between seven and 13 oval leaflets, each with pointed tips. There's a very gently toothed margin to them, and not as much as the rowan, as we'll see. And the leaf, as I said, is the largest. It can be up to 35 centimetres long, the whole thing. So it's much larger, you can see it, compared to my hand. Also, the ash doesn't have clusters of flowers like um, the rowan and the elder do. Um, so that's really um, important to recognise as well. And there's another feature about the ash, which we'll get to, okay, as to um, how you can help recognise it, especially from distance. But let's go over to rowan, otherwise known as mountain ash, which is why I can get confused. And this is where Latin names can be very useful because we know we're all talking about the same thing. So rowan and ash are not related at all not related as trees, but they share a common name there, the mountain ash and the ash. But having a look here, this is the underside of the uh, leaf that you can see here. These leaves aren't in opposite pairs, they're alternate. So you'll get one of these leaves, one, two, three, four, as opposed to two, four, six, eight on the twig. So that immediately, if you're using those key principles, will tell you you haven't got ash because the leaves are not um, opposites. So it's got to be something else. And in this case, it's the rowan. So that's really, really useful. Um, each leaflet's much smaller though, up to about six centimetres long, um, whereas the other ones are much larger on the ash. And we've got between five and eight pairs of leaves here and a terminal leaf. So that means you've got anywhere between 11 and 17 leaflets per leaf. So there's more little leaflets in the rowan than there are on the ash. And they're usually more clustered together. I'm just gonna skip forward and see if we've got a picture. No, we haven't got another picture of the leaf there. But something else to look out for is the berries. These are the developing berries in summer. Um, you, they start off kind of green and then start to go kind of yellow, orange and turn to red. The ash doesn't have anything like this. Its fruit is very different as we'll see later on. So if you're seeing these developing berries, again, it's not ash. So we can use other signs. Okay, it also comes into leaf, the rowan, well before the ash as well. Uh, the rowan's out kind of mid-spring, whereas the ash doesn't come into leaf until late spring. And this year it's been particularly late, right at the back end of May, coming into leaf, the ash. Also, the other thing to look out for is earlier on in the season, these berries will be an umbel of white flowers, um, which look very much like elder flowers, which we'll get to. But look out for that with the rowan. Again, the ash doesn't have anything like that. We've got the mature flowers there, uh, sorry, mature berries there as well. And these can be mature um, in summer. Um, usually it's kind of cited that these berries are at their best um, in autumn, um, but they can be looking their best in summer. And uh, it depends on how we do with the season. Last year, I think I was looking in July and uh, those berries were ready to go. Um, but mostly they're ripe for wildlife, eaten by wildlife in the early autumn. That's when the birds go for them. Okay, that's the rowan. There's the rowan's form. It's a much smaller tree than the ash, that's worth noting, whereas the ash will get to a large mature tree. The rowan um, is a much smaller kind of shrubby tree and it often has this very narrow character to it. 
This one on the left is classic Rowan, a really narrow, compact character with a dome or pointed top and lots of trunks coming from the base, where Ash is a much larger tree-like tree, for want of a better term. Um, yeah, whereas the Rowan is much more of a scrubby tree. Let's have a look at Elder. Now, Elder's leaves are in opposite pairs, like the Ash. So, Ash and Elder are opposite, Rowan are alternate. Now, with the Elder, again, it's a small scrubby tree, more like the Rowan, um, but again, it's opposite pairs, so we wouldn't get those confused. And there's a lot less leaf flirts, usually between five and seven, um, sometimes nine, but usually between five and seven there, um, you've got one terminal leaf. So the Elder there, a lot less leaf flirts than either of them, and the whole leaf around 12 centimeters long, although well, I've seen it larger. No, each leaflet, sorry, 12 centimeters long. A finely toothed margin, and if you crush the leaves, they can have an unpleasant smell to them. Um, and uh, let's have a quick look at um, what we've got here. Here you can really see the leaves in opposite pairs there, the stalks coming out. And there's our elder flower, a really big sign of elder, and they're all coming out right now at the start of June. Um, they can come out at the end of May as well, but a really good sign that we've got elder there. There's the elder flowers out on the tree there, a classic sign of early summer, and you'll get that smell, which you don't get with rowan flowers so much. Um, the elder flower smell is quite distinctive. Um, we do recognize that. Um, also, um, here's the flowers developing. You can see them I mean, in really good condition on the right and then just ready to kind of come out on the left. And then to the back end of summer, you're gonna get this. This is really interesting with the elder. Look at the color of the leaf. It starts to turn a kind of plummy purple. That's really interesting. Um, so look out for that. Um, and uh, also look at the, um, the flowers now. They've matured and they've started to turn into something else. Little green kind of um, early berries, which are gonna mature into something very different, into this, elderberries. So whereas you get clusters of berries on Rowan, which are turning from green to red, with elder, they're turning from green to black. So there's a real difference between those. So that's the difference between that lot there, guys. Um, different ones, we're gonna whisk straight through because we are um, getting on with time as usual. Had lots of questions um, in the chat room, which is great to see. Let's do some maples. We're gonna go for the differences between the three most common maples that you'll see. So going back to those maple-like leaves, we've got the field maple, the sycamore, and the Norway maple, which certainly where I am is a very commonly planted and non-native. This is a picture from autumn, but it's the only picture I've got with all three species side by side. And um, so you have to bear with me, but uh, imagine they're green. But what we've got here, we can see the shape despite a bit of deterioration on the Norway maple. The smallest is the field maple. So this really gives you an idea of the size difference between them. The sycamores on the left, a darker brown when it's fallen. Um, and then you've got the Norway maple on the right, a much more dramatic leaf all round. But immediately with the field maple, we can see everything about it is much smaller than the other two. So sycamore first, the one that most of us be um, familiar with. It is an acer, um, although it's not called a maple in its common name. It's a non-native, but it's been naturalized in the countryside. Um, it's a big tree, it can grow to about 35 meters tall, um, leaves up to about 15 centimeters long, and again, Canadian flag, think of that, the five lobes there, the five points, a bit like a hand, that's the maple light leaf we've got there. And there's the helicopters, which most people will uh, recognize, uh, probably play with them as kids, maybe you still do, but they spin in the air when you throw them. In fact, they work much better if you break them in half and just throw one up, that spins much better. But we'll come to those in a sec, here they are. Look at the angle of them. So away from the leaves now with the sycamore, look at the angle, how they're kind of pointed down, they're not 45 degrees, but they can be, but sitting kind of acutely pointed, much more so than the field maple, as you'll see. They're also larger, okay? These wing C cases, very familiar. Here's the leaf there with those wing C cases to give you a bit of an idea between the two there. Um, the sycamore is also a tree which casts a lot of shade. It's a very dense, heavy tree in its canopy, casts a lot of shade to the woodland floor. Um, and it can outcompete uh, um, native species, which is why quite a lot of kind of foresters or conservationists don't really like the sycamore. But actually the sycamore does host a very large aphid population. So in terms of a larder for wildlife, it actually um, keeps a lot of food on it in terms of the aphids. So it does have a bit of a wildlife benefit there. And the timber's very good stuff as well. 
but it's one tree that um, if we're managing woodland, we may want to keep in check because it can have a slightly invasive quality because it's so good at what it does. It's quite fast growing. Something else that you get on sycamore that you don't get with the others is this tar spot, tar spot fungus. Um, you get this as soon as the sycamore leaves get any age, they start to get this a lot. And um, not always, but it's actually a sign of good air quality. Um, you think it was the opposite, but it's a sign of good air quality. And it doesn't harm the tree, this fungus. It lives alongside it. And when the spores are done, they go into the ground and then they uh, go up into the air again in the next year and do their thing on the leaf. But these black spots, appropriately called tar spot, a really good way of recognising sycamore leaves, especially later in the season, because the other two don't get this. So really look out for that. Let's have a little look where we're at now. Let's move on to field maple. Our native, our only native maple actually, much smaller as we've seen, and the lobes there, very much more rounded, less pointed, very much uh, like the Canadian flag there, it does look like it, you've got your five points there on the leaf. Um, and the whole tree is small as well, it's not just the leaves, it's a shrubby, scrubby tree, more in the hedgerows and woodland edge, it doesn't reach the heights of sycamore or Norway maple. Um, here are the leaves out on the branch there. You can see beautiful little uh, maple leaves, lovely stuff all around. And it's a dark green, the colour. But this is interesting because not all of them have five clear lobes. Here's one that has three, although you can see two little tiny lobes at the back here. So technically still five, but it's interesting just to see a bit of variation in the leaf there, the field maple. Um, here's the uh, seeds of the maple and look how the wings are not downward pointed, but they're more at like 180 degrees. They're not always at an angle to each other, but most commonly they are. They're also smaller, as we'll see, than the sycamore and Norway maple. So look out for that with the wings more flat as opposed to pointed down. That's something else to look out for on the tree. Here are, oh, what have we got here? These are field maple leaves. A um, bit of variation in the size there. Quite a large field maple leaf there, um, and a more average one to the left. But just showing you a range of sizes that you've got. But generally, look across the tree, they'll be much smaller than the sycamore. Something else to look out for if the leaves are confusing you. Look out for this on field maple, on the bark. You won't see it on every tree, but it's quite common. What's called crocodile's back. And it looks just like that on some twigs and some of the branches. These ridges, actually these ridges are soft if you push your thumb into them. So they look like a crocodile's back. Um, uh, so these ridges there, and it's quite distinctive of field maple. So a really good thing to look out for. Not on every tree, but worth knowing. And then in autumn, uh, the field maple leaves go consistently yellow when they fall, whereas the sycamore don't, and they're much more dirty in their colour. So that's a really good thing to look out for um, with the field maple, that yellow colour carpeting the floor in autumn. Norway maple, moving on. Introduced species, uh, not native, but commonly planted in urban areas, car parks, business parks, school grounds, all kinds. Introduced in the 17th century. Um, and so you're less likely to see it out the countryside. So again, tuning in, less likely to see this. It's more likely to be sycamore, but not always. Um, and also it tolerates polluted air, which is another reason why it's planted in urban areas. But look at the leaf. It's much more dramatic all around, isn't it? Those points are much more dramatic as opposed to the more subtle uh, point of the sycamore there. Um, here we go. And in autumn, you get amazing colours with the uh, uh, Norway maple as well. Much more dramatic colours, much more like you expect to see in kind of New England, um, these beautiful greens, golden browns and yellows as well. Um, and have a look at this one with its lovely colours as well. Really beautiful. Um, you don't get this with sycamore. They just turn a much more dirtier colour. So if you're getting those fantastic colours, it's a Norway maple or could well be another non-native maple, but it's not sycamore. OK, the um, helicopters are much larger. Here they are side by side. We've got field maple on the left, sycamore in the middle, and then Norway maple on the right. Look how much bigger those Norway maple helicopters are compared to the others. They're massive in comparison. So again, you've got you know, much more of a comparison. They're much more like this kind of size. Um, but there's a really good comparison between the three there and what they can look like. So look out for that as well. And of course, in autumn, they're all going to brown off and they're going to be falling. OK. That's those three there, guys, those three um, common trees.
Uh, okay. Right, folks. Now we're going to move quickly on to trees with summer fruit and flowers, because we've been talking about leaves, but there's other signs we can look out for. I can see we're a little bit short of time, folks. We might run slightly over, but I want to get all this good content to you. So let's move on to the next segment right away. First of all, lime trees. We mentioned these, the heart-shaped leaves. They're in that group. Here's our three limes, all side by side. Small leaf lime, larger leaf lime, and then the common lime, which is a hybrid between those two. So you can see how generally it falls somewhere in the middle. But they're all very much heart-shaped. So this is what we're looking out for with the leaves. But look at this flower. The reason why I've talked about lime flowers now is because most trees flower in spring, whereas limes leave it till summer. Um, so if you're seeing um, uh, uh, leaves on a large tree with heart-shaped leaves, um, it's uh, probably a lime tree. Here's the lime leaves here. They're clustered, very kind of fragrant flowers, a kind of yellowish white color. The, the flowers look very similar on the three lines there, so we're not gonna go into the differences between the three. But what's really interesting about these, not only the time you're seeing them in summer, but this leaf here. Look at this leaf that my cursor's traveling down. This isn't the same as the rest of them. This is a long finger-like leaf, and this is a special leaf called a bract. And a bract is associated with the flower. It's a special leaf that comes out from the uh, twig there. And look at how the stalk for the flower comes from the center of this bract. If you see these little bracts, which I think we'll see better in the next picture, here they are. Look how different they are from the main leaf of the lime there. So in summer, there's two leaves, two different totally shaped leaves on lime trees. So immediately, it can't be anything else. You've got your heart shaped leaves, which you can see underneath there, and then the bracts next to the flowers there, attached to the flowers. Um, and as the season goes on, they'll start green, but they'll start to go kind of yellowish and then brown as the season goes on. And in autumn and winter, you can find these on the floor. So they're a really good way to find out you've got a lime tree when there's no leaves up on, on the branch, but you can find these bracts on the ground below. But really distinctive and easy thing to recognize. The flowers themselves, as I said, are very fragrant. You can actually make a tea out of the flowers. It's very good for you. Um, and these bracts, they have a narrow tip, as you can see there. It's not pointed at all. Let's have another look at those in action there. You can see the bracts compared to the heart-shaped leaves. Really easy to spot there. So those are the lime flowers. There we go, more bracts. Such an easy way to recognize the tree in the summer. You don't even have to use the main leaves. You've got those bracts there. So all limes have those. Okay, let's do another one. Wild cherry versus bird cherry. Here's the leaves side by side. Um, they're both very common um, trees. Um, there are lots of uh, more non-native trees and cultivated varieties of uh, cherries, uh, which are planted formally in people's gardens and in urban spaces. But we're talking about our two natives, wild cherry and bird cherry, um, both prunus trees. So they are related. Um, on the left, we have the wild cherry leaf, a little bit narrower and much more toothed. And on the right, bird cherry, which as a leaf doesn't really have too much about it that we can pick out. It's oval with a pointed tip. Luckily, there's other things that we can use to work out it's bird cherry, but it's good to see them side by side. What I want to talk to you about though really is the fruit. Um, because again, a lot of trees leave their nuts and fruit until autumn, whereas the cherries are doing it in summer. So the fact that you're seeing fruit on the tree in summer it's gonna give you a hint that you've got a cherry. It's not the only one, but it's the main one you probably see. These are the wild cherries here. Um, they start off kind of um, green. There they are. This is what they look, at, look like right now out in the countryside. They should be out any time now, but everything's a little bit late this year. They start off green, small, but then they start to turn yellow and then orange and red, and they get to this deep red color, the classic cherries that we know from the supermarket. Only these ones taste better because they're free. And, and you forage them, so it always tastes better if you have to go gather them yourself. But look out for the classic cherries on the tree. That is the wild cherry. However, you're going to have to beat the birds to them because they can literally be on the tree for a few days and the birds decimate them all. The birds will even eat them when they're not even fully ripe yet, like that. So you can try them when they're like this. They might still be palatable for you. It depends from tree to tree. I've certainly eaten them like this and they've been fine. Um, but look out for these. They're not on, out for long because the birds will hammer them. But then what you'll see is kind of discarded cherry um, stones on the floor and bits of stalk with a, the, some of the flesh left over on the tree. 
And there's the cherry leaves as well. And look how the cherries are growing in bunches, on long stalks in bunches together. That's important, and we'll get to that soon. The other thing to look out for in cherry is from mid-July onwards, the leaves actually can start to turn. They can start to turn a bright, deep scarlet red colour, um, which is interesting because it's quite early. Um, and they'll start to fall slowly. And you'll also start to get fallen cherries on the floor. So you can see we've got a collection of stones, um, fallen cherries and fallen leaves. And that's interesting because you don't get this with bird cherry. So look on the floor from anywhere um, kind of mid-July onward to look for this kind of thing. Also look how the leaves have curled up. Here's bird cherry, very different beast when it comes to its fruit. For a start, don't eat these. They're only fit for birds, hence the name. They're very sour. I think there is an alcoholic drink you can make from it, but I've never tried it myself. But they're very different. They're smaller, smaller than the cherries for a start. They're also you know, deep purple black color, whereas the cherries are turning from green to red. These are going from green to black. OK, um, also the bird cherry and um, fruit, they grow on single stalks. And that's interesting because the wild cherry grow in bunches. So to offer, often together in bunches, whereas these are much more singly. So even though these, these are in a group, they're all on their own individual um, kind of little stalk off the branch here. Um, it's a different structure to the wild cherries. The wild cherries hang much more. Whereas you can see here, the stalk that the bird cherries sit on is a much more kind of upright, kind of stronger structure all around. They look like little slows, um, like you get on the blackthorn. So I find that's quite a, a nice way to remember them because um, if you're seeing something that looks like a, a slow, like the blackthorn fruit in summer, it's probably a bird cherry. So a really good way to recognize the difference between the two there. Very quickly, spindle. Um, I love spindle, it's a beautiful little tree. At this time of year, it doesn't look like there's a lot going on with it. Um, looks just like a scrubby tree that melts into the background of the hedgerow, but there's something going on at this time of year. And you can see it on the picture on the left. If we get a bit closer, we see these structures, these young um, fruits that are forming. They're not ripe yet. When they are ripe, they'll get pretty spectacular. But for now, the shape is really interesting. They look like, to me, like little Chinese lanterns. That's how I remember them. There's four little bumps there, and each one of those is going to have a seed in it. Here it is a bit closer. Really interesting, the spindle there. Nothing else looks like this. They're quite small. So if you're seeing that on a bush, it's the spindle. But once the autumn hits, and you know, late, even late summer, this is what you start to get. All the leaves suddenly go a beautiful pink, red color, and the fruits transform their color. Look at this, that green, which you know you could easily walk right by, suddenly is shouting out this deep, deep, like cerise pink color, beautiful things. And they have a little orange seeds inside, which you can see hanging there. Look again, like Chinese lanterns. That's how I remember them. And you can see the colour turning on the leaves here from green to red. And here they are um, in the studio, pink and orange, the fruits now. This is uh, back in the summer in autumn um, and the beautiful red leaves. So they've made that transformation. So if what I'm saying here is the spindle is one to watch in summer. It starts off quite unobtrusive. Then you get those little green kind of Chinese lanterns and then they go this spectacular colour. So watch out for it. Just quickly, folks, we're going to go through spotting trees from a distance, and then we're going to um, talk about where you can get some more resources and do a QA. and um, This is the ash tree. Um, and when we're looking at trees from a distance, this is where we are using that key principle of tuning in. Now, in the ash there on the left, it's hard to see, but I was noticing some shapes in the canopy. And on the picture on the left, right, you can see that better. These dark bunches of something going on as we approach it. So there's something going on in the canopy and that shape, those shapes in itself are really interesting for recognizing ash from a distance without getting too close. As we get closer, we can start to see um, when they're not silhouetted, they're a dark, uh, kind of light brown color. They look dry and they're hanging in bunches throughout the tree there. And so this was taken today. And as we get even closer, we can see they are the old seeds from last year and they hang down in bunches like bunches of keys and they're called ash keys and they hang around on the tree all through the year um, and the new ones should be coming onto the trees anytime from now um, and 
as they come on fresh on the tree, they look like this. This was taken last year. Um, and these are the young ash keys, which are bright green. They're actually an edible food. Um, but when they're old, they look like this. So we're looking at those bunches, those heavy bunches in the tree. Look out for it. Um, look at those heavy bunches in the ash trees and you've got the ash. Scott's pine, um, very quickly, there's needles, um, a little baby cone forming, but we're talking from a distance. So if we take a step back, first of all, when the sun hits it at the start or end of the day, you get a beautiful orange hue on the trunk. You don't get this with the Corsican pine, which is the other big pine tree that's planted throughout uh, the UK. The Scots pine is our one native pine tree. But look at that beautiful orange hue. You get this kind of a third up the trunk and you really only get this with the Scots pines. It's something to look out for and you can really spot it from a distance, from a way off. You can see it here on this tree. You can just see this bright orange here on the tree, relatively bright orange, uh, you know, when it comes to bark. But you can just see that colour there on the, uh, on the uh, trunk there. The other thing I want to draw your attention to with the Scots pine is this shape. When it's younger, it's difficult to tell apart from other conifers. It's got this kind of conical shape, looks a bit like a Christmas tree, doesn't really look um, like anything that's going to set it apart. But when it's older, look at what it does. Do you see how the branches flatten out into layers? This is what it does with time and age. <clears throat> I think they look a bit like clouds. And you can spot this in the landscape, especially in upland areas where it's out on its own, like here. And it flattens out like this. Spruces and firs don't do this. The larch doesn't do it either. Um, but the Scots pine does. So look for this characteristic shape where the branches flatten out. Here's another great one here, really good silhouette. Gone is that conical shape and everything is really flattening out there. There's another example there. I think we've got larch actually there on the left. That's larch, it's taking winter. But of course, because it's evergreen, the Scots pine, um, this shape is good all year. And look how it's really flattened out the shape of it there. You can see that there, they look like little clouds, I think. So look for the flattening branches with Scots pine when it's mature and you've got Scots pine. So you can recognize a tree even from a distance. <coughs> Lastly, the oak. We're very familiar with oaks, but it's just worth noting that oak has got a classic shape. First of all, oak is commonly planted in a field out on its own. Um, you can see some young oaks being planted to the side of it there. But when it's mature, it looks like a lollipop on a stick, I think. How a kid would draw a tree. You've got a short, stubby stick there, the trunk, and then you can almost draw a circle around the tree. And that's because oaks, when they're mature, they're generally as wide as they are tall. So they look quite kind of roundish, almost squarish in their shape. Um, they're not so much um, tall trees, more wide and tall together. So that outline of the oak is very classic and it's one that we're very familiar with, so look out for it. Um, when they're younger, they can be a bit more conical, but when they're mature, look out for this shape. Okay, yeah, there's a nice mature oak there as well. Really nice to see that as wide as it is tall and a big, thick, stubby um, trunk there. Right, folks, that's a whistle-stop tour of trees in summer. But if you've enjoyed this, there's more to come. We're going to do a Q&A in a minute with everybody. Um, and uh, you'll be able to check, um, chime in on that and ask me some questions. We'll stick around for that. But before we do that, I want to tell you about where you can get some more uh, resources because um, I've created an online tree ID course and I've got a good announcement about that. Some of you guys might know about this. There's a lot of you that might already be on my free um, Kickstart Your Tree ID Skills course. If you are, hello to you guys. But um, there is a much larger course called the Complete Tree ID course, and all these pictures are taken from that, and there's a lot more. Let me tell you all about this, guys, because it's a real passion project that I've created and something I'm very proud of, and I've had some great feedback from people who are on it. Basically, it will take you from clueless to confident on all our kind of native and naturalised tree species in all four seasons. So you can go on your way to becoming a tree expert with this. There are 35 tree species currently on the course, and that is increasing with time as time goes on. Um, you'll learn not only how to identify trees and leaves like we have today, but also how to use bark, how to use buds, how to use flowers, catkins, fruit, leaf litter, tree form. All four seasons are covered. And one of the things you get when you join the course is you get these cheat sheets 
which have got a little montage of them here. And as you can see, there's four seasons there, spring, summer, autumn, winter. And you get a sheet that you can either download to your phone, so it, you don't have to take it out with you, and you can just put it on there, or you can print it out and take it out with you, put it in your pocket, and it breaks down um, all the key features to look out for with each tree in each season. So really comprehensive, and it's really a great you know, cheat to get you recognizing all the key features of trees. There's also photo galleries of the trees in all four seasons. So there's hundreds of high quality photos on there. Take them both out on location in all four seasons and also in the studio. So you can see what fallen leaf litter looks like, what spring catkins look like, winter buds and summer leaves as well. So loads of resources on there. There's 35 tree species in all four seasons. You get live student only workshops. The next one of those is in July. Um, you can get one-to-one -one coaching with me as well if you really want to take it further. And I'm going to do a special offer as well for everybody who's attended this workshop to launch the summer module because I'm just about to launch tomorrow all my summer videos. I'm going to do 20% off on the course for seven days only starting very soon. You'll get an email all about it. So look out for news on that. So if you're interested in joining the course, if you're on the free course already and mm, been um and ahhing about joining, Now's a great time to join because there's 20% off. And not only do you get when you join all that tree stuff, you also get some nice feedback there, but you also get access to this, a bonus course called Your Wild Food Year, which is all about wild food and foraging, which is something me and my wife, Lee, have been working on. There's 12 modules to this, one for each month, taking you through the best foraging and wild food commonly found throughout the year. So this is thrown in when you join on the top two um, tiers of the course. Um, there's guest speakers um, in the Wild Food course. It's not just me and Lee presenting the videos there. We have people from all over the world of bushcraft, foraging and wild food and wild medicine there. Real experts um, sharing their knowledge. So they're all part of the course. You get that content too. And you get a load of bonus videos when you join that as well. You get um, how to find pig nut, looking for reed mace, monthly foraging walks every month where we go out and look at food um, in the location, how to use spruce, there's absolutely tons of content on there and it's all included with the tree ID course. But wait, there's more. If all this talk of courses sounds great, but you're not entirely sure and you wanna kind of check the quality of the content and see what it's like, you can dip your toe in the water. And many of you already have. There's already two and a half thousand people on my free taster course. And this is a taster of the large course that I just talked about called Kickstart Your Tree ID Skills. This is three trees, hazel, feel, maple, and the ash in all four seasons with all the videos, cheat sheets, and photos. Um, and it gives you a taste of the quality of the course. So if you want to check that out, it will cost you absolutely nothing. It's totally free to do. Um, you can join that today. Um, I'll send an email all about it. In fact, I think Lee might put a link in the uh, chat room all about how to get access to that. It's free to join, and I'd love you guys to join. And if you have um, enjoyed the free course or you're on the paid course, let people know in the chat room and um, tell them if you think it's any good. Hopefully you do. <laughs> We've had lots of great feedback and uh, it's been uh, a lot of fun creating it. It's still going on. It's been three years in the making, so it's very comprehensive. And as time goes on, I'm going to be adding more trees. If you'd like to know more about that, drop me an email, trees at woodlandclassroom.com. Or if you're watching on YouTube, pop a comment um, in the comments or follow the links in the description to find out more about how you can get access to those courses. But for everyone watching live, I'm going to send you an email tomorrow with a link to some of this stuff and you'll get some emails over the next few days about the offer and what's included on the course. Some great feedback. Okay, folks, let's do a Q&A. We've run a little bit over, but I'm happy to stay for five, 10 minutes and do some questions. So if anybody has a question about summer trees and identifying trees or perhaps other times of the year, put it in the chat room now and uh, let's see what we've got here. Thanks, Ian. Ian says it was most interesting. So William Atkinson asks, I'd like to try pressing leaves for ID. Can you press leaves in spring and summer as well as autumn? You know, uh, William, I've not tried it myself. Um, I don't see why you couldn't. I guess the more um, water content that something has, the more chance it can go moldy. I mean, flowers are very thin, aren't they? Um, so, you know, they can dry out easily, whereas leaves, there can be a little bit more to them. I'd have um, uh, a play and see what happens. Give it a go. Um, try it out for yourself and let us know how it goes. I don't press them myself. I just take a lot of photos 
um, and uh, remember it that way. Okay. Why does epicormic growth happen? That's a great question from Sue Hughes. So epicormic growth is that bushy, small growth, new growth that you get with mature trees. Oaks do it, alders do it, um, willows do it, quite a few trees, limes do it. What it is, it's a natural part of the tree's um, mature, maturity, it's growth process. What it does is, let's think about an oak. As an oak gets a lot older and it gets a lot thicker in its trunk, it finds it harder and harder to support the massive crown that it has above it because it gets wider and the middle of the oak becomes hollow as the heartwood dies out. So it can't support the huge crown. And that's why you get kind of dead branches like stags antlers in the crown. So what it does many years in advance is it puts out epicormic growth. And this is new growth lower down the tree, which recenters the tree and takes the weight away from the fringes and puts it more closer to the tree. So old oak trees can often not be as huge. They've got wide girths, but not a huge crown. And that's because it's adjusting itself over time to um, be able to um, increase its lifespan. That's what it's doing. So the epicormic growth is like an insurance policy on the tree. It's got its main crown, but the epicormic growth comes out. And as that crown dies out and the oak selectively lets those limbs die, it, um, the epicorn growth can take over and that can become new limbs in itself. So when uh, the epicorn growth is kind of taken off on lime trees and streets, which has often happened, it's not great for the lime tree because it's trying to put that out to prolong its life. Um, so there's only you know, so many years they'll be able to shave that off. Okay. Am I planning on publishing a book anytime soon, Stephanie? That's a great question, thanks very much. I guess the course is my book. Um, in many ways, it's something that's published and it's something you can buy and join onto. It's got all the pictures. It's got lots of videos of me talking. Um, there's a lot of good books out there. Um, I'd love to put the stuff into a book, but I think the course is my book, the Complete Tree ID course. That has got all my information on it. The great thing about it is I can adjust it as I learn more stuff, whereas a book, you can't change the pages and put new ones in. But with an online course, you can. So if anything ever changes or I learn more stuff, I can add that into the course. So the course is my book. But maybe someday, if anybody knows a publisher, tell them to get in touch. <laughs> Any other questions while we're here before we sign off? Heidi asks, what category do ginkgo trees come under? We're not doing um, exotic trees on this course, Heidi. Um, mostly just the um, uh, native and naturalized trees. Sue says, can you make tea with lime flowers? Yes, you don't use the leaves, you use the flowers and it makes a nice tea, very fragrant very good for you. I can't remember exactly what health benefits it has, but join our wild food workshop that'll be running in July, perhaps, and you'll be able to find out more about that. But yeah, it makes a good tea. They're not quite out yet. I think that's everybody's questions for now. Everybody's saying thank you very much. That's lovely. And that's probably enough for now. I've run over, so I'll let you guys go. Don't forget to check out the uh, Complete Tree ID course if you want to know more. If you want to dip your toe in the water, check out Kickstart Your Tree ID Skills, which is the free introductory course. I hope everybody's enjoyed this. I will uh, be sending you some more information via email of other resources and other things we're getting up to and about the course as well, and also about the special offer and how you can access that 20% off if you want to sign up and join um, the Tree ID course. We'd love to see you there. But for anyone else, I will see you in autumn when we'll do this all over again. And we'll be looking at fruits, nuts, berries, leaf color, and when leaves fall at different times of the year, what's going on in the woodlands in autumn. So looking forward to finishing off our quadrology of tree courses. We'll have all four seasons covered. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Hope to see you again. If you've got any big questions, drop us a line and hope to see you on the course soon. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great weekend when it comes. Bye for now, folks. Bye-bye.